and um, you know, for, for let's say Lampert, especially, and we use Coffee's algorithms in our in our, in our product. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it. What I'm going to really focus on today is to give you an idea of the kinds of extreme use cases that people have been used, you know, uh, that needs to be solved in, especially in terms of fraud detection, uh, risk management, etc., for payment systems, and why and how uh, we have used uh, a different kind of database architecture which takes uh, SLAs to a whole new level. You know, one of the things uh, in the previous talk was about SLAs, uh, 99 percentile of, an, you know, of latency being less than 10 milliseconds. Uh, we at Aerospike uh, actually solve problems where the 99th percentile has to be well under one millisecond, so 10 times uh, more extreme in terms of SLA kind of, um, SLAs that we have to achieve. So that's kind of the general you know, high level uh, setting for the talk. Uh, let's talk about some of the use cases and what people are trying to do in this area, or have been doing. And these are all from, all the use cases I have here are real deployments. I will not um, mention any customer names, uh, but these are pretty, um, you know, well-known uh, uh, companies in the world. Uh, the business challenge uh, for a large retail bank in terms of risk management, they hit this challenge a couple of years ago, and what actually happened to them was, you know, and I'll talk a little bit about it later, but uh, uh, generally, you know, uh, a relational database uh, becomes very slow uh, when you have to uh, deal with a lot of changes as well as uh, provide low read latency for a large number of requests. Uh, and this is essentially because of the way uh, the data is brought into cache from persistent storage using buffering and so on. There are papers by Mike Stonebreaker on this maybe 10, 15 years ago uh, on why it is that uh, it happens and why uh, database systems need a rewrite. This was, you know, that is one of the reasons why the NoSQL uh, kind of movement started. It got driven from the internet, uh, where I have some experience. You know, I have some experience in databases as well as in running internet systems. And caching is a very common way to solve such scaling problems. Uh, but it came with a bunch of cost. You know, at some point, this particular uh, bank uh, required, you know, needed to scale it up by about 6x. They were already running with 150 caching servers. And then a hybrid memory architecture ended up with them using less than 10 servers. You know, and, and it's all about hardware and how you leverage flash and what kind of algorithms you can do to enable real-time access uh, by not really using a lot of DRAM. Another kind of use case is in fraud detection. This is again a very large payment company in the world. Uh, and the fraud detection uh, use case here is the business challenge again is very similar. These guys are already at scale. Uh, they were using a certain relational database and a caching solution in front of them. And what happened in that case was um, they again reached about 200 um, kind of servers. You know, all of the data had to be in memory or in DRAM, um, and, and the whole management nightmare of operations came in. Uh, they were achieving their SLAs at a certain scale that we're in. This was again a few years ago. After which, uh, they, they, they were growing explosively. Uh, they needed to kind of size the system for 10 times higher. And again, once again, a 200 node cluster got reduced to 20 nodes using this kind of hybrid uh, memory architecture that I'm talking about today. And that's, that's the kind of uh, change. Again, you, you need to maintain the same SLAs of a millisecond or so for these requests. So if you look at um, how these systems are set up, um, essentially, uh, you have something on the edge. And this is a hybrid memory database. You know, Aerospike is uh, essentially the only one I know of that's at this extreme level. And, and, and essentially, you have a bunch of machine learning and various algorithms in the front edge, which enables um, these um, uh, you know, systems to make real-time decisions based on some model. The models themselves are not necessarily computed in the front edge. They're computed using traditional technology that you know of, like Teradata, Hadoop, you know, edge-based Spark, you know, pick your favorite kind of analytics algorithm to generate models on lots of data, feed that into a front edge database, which is based on hybrid memory, and then in real time, you can achieve, uh, you know, amazing levels of, uh, you know, what I would say throughput with very low latency and high uptime, you know. And, and again, you know, low latency, heavy write load, 100% uptime, all the things uh, um, the Cosmos DB folks talked about are all applicable in these areas. And there are a whole bunch of use cases in this area even though I'm focusing more on the payment, payment side. So what exactly is the problem? Right? Why do you need a million transactions per second database? You know, it is very clear why the Cosmos DB folks need it. They are doing a global database. They are kind of replacing something across the world. And of course, they're going to have trillions of transactions. But Aerospike also delivers across all our customers trillions of these transactions a day. 
and some of them run on the cloud, some of them run on Azure even, you know, some of them run on Amazon, many of them run on their own data center, achieving this. So what are these billions of transactions, you know, uh, which people are doing? Why is it even happening? And this is not actually a competitor. Everything I'm talking about here is not about old relational kind of use cases at all. You know, I'm a myself relationally based person. This is a completely new use cases driven by the internet use. You know, for example, the Indian internet market is growing like leaps and bounds, you know, and, and, and I think it was what, about six months ago, uh, all the money was sucked out of the system. That was a kind of interesting shock, right? It, it immediately vaulted India to a leadership space in, in, in kind of, um, you know, what do you call it, um, in the new kinds of payments. And that's kind of interesting, right? And people like, you know, Paytm, you know, uh, free charge and so on, especially Paytm, have become like household names in India because of that. And that's kind of fundamental to some of the things that are going on. Payment is, you know, ecosystem has, you know, normally when you go pay with cash, you just go somewhere and you pay cash and you're done. You know, if you're using a Paytm account, you're paying somebody, there's a person who pays, the person who receives the payment. You know, but is that enough? Because the payment comes through all kinds of channels, right? So you, you have people, you know, ordering something on a particular government website, you know, and then there's a simple, you know, uh, a simple model will suggest that you just do some fraud analysis based on just this information. But that's wholly inadequate because, you know, if, when you're walking around, right, for example, sometimes the Wi-Fi here, as soon as everybody showed up, it was really working well in the morning, when everybody showed up, it kind of, there was a little glitch, some of you might have noticed. Right? At that time, if I did, ha you know, I, I could do my Paytm transaction through the, uh, not through Wi-Fi, through some other, you know, through my carrier network. Now, if, depending on where the fraud is happening, somebody could have hijacked either the Wi-Fi network or the carrier gateway or whatever it is, you need to be able to figure out where all these transactions are coming from. You can't just focus on the sender or the receiver, and that's kind of fundamentally the point. And then it gets even more complicated, you know, there are, you know, a zillion channels through which all of these requests come in. So what is it that you have to track in order to detect fraud? in a payment system. You have to really understand and have great visibility into every actor in your network. An actor is not just the person paying and the person receiving the payment. There are like a zillion other actors in terms of intermediate gateways. Uh, you know, you can come to a website which is kind of spoofing something on your network. You, know, you think you're going to, you know, a website, but it's basically, you know, you're going to some kind of scaffolding page. And all of that needs to be understood by anybody on the other side. You know, they get all this information through the network. They can actually track it. And that's kind of fundamentally the point. And there are a bunch of companies I've indi indicated here. But the main thing is all of them have in common basically uh, one thing, which is they want to detect fraud in terms of what's going on in the world, you know, in, 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 in terms of the network. And they have probably a few number of business transactions per second. You know, we talk about trillions and millions and all of that. But actually, the number of people actually in India or for that matter, any particular place like North America paying per second is not like a million people are buying things per second and making payments. But in order to kind of detect fraud, you know, keep track of it, you have to not just do reads. You have to keep track of the fact that somebody came in and did make a payment, didn't make a payment. You got to be making a lot of writes. But also for each of that data, you got to look at transaction history on every actor in the system. It could be thousands of basically reads and writes of the database for each business transaction. And there is really mostly the, the traditional databases simply will not handle it. It will handle it if you would do a lot of work on top of it in order to get the low latency, for example. Because if you can't detect fraud within seconds, you know, and if you let it go on for hours, you're gonna lose a lot of money. You can, of course, correct it later, but the amount of business risk is immense, and you can make all of that go away if you have a database which can handle millions of transactions per second on the edge with very low latency and high uptime. That's fundamental, fundamentally what a hybrid uh, memory architecture um, allows you to do. I just wanna say a couple of words here on the actual India market when I'm speaking in. Uh, Bangalore. I mean, I've been observing this market. I mean, I've, I've been visiting like maybe every three months for uh, almost like 15 years. Um, you, know, I, you know, I work in technology and, and basically in, the, in these kinds of areas. And what I'm seeing here is not any different than what I saw earlier in the U.S. and what happened in China maybe 10 years ago. So the, all these companies, right? They they just not going to be household names right now. They're going to be immensely popular because they haven't executed all that. They're going to be huge global food companies, like you know. Um, uh, like all of the, the whole Alibaba kind of uh, system that, that China has thrown up. There's gonna be like many such things coming out of India, right? And, and the scale is only going to increase. It's going to double. If you think trillions a day is enough today, you're gonna need like 10 trillion within probably a few years, okay? So that's kind of how, uh, you, know, um, you know, this market is evolving. And I think, I think that's actually a great opportunity for the kind of work that the Cosmos DB folks are doing as well as what we are doing uh, to, to kind of help companies reach there. There's also another interesting thing. 
know, there's the whole thing about, oh, we can just solve all these real-time problems using a streaming system. It is true that you can do really sophisticated things with a streaming system. But when you have a very sparse database, so in the sense that you have, you know, India has a billion people, each of them has, let's say, at some point will have, like, you know, everybody's going to have, have a device after the Reliance uh, Geo announcement, it's all going to be smartphones. So what will happen is, uh, they'll get two. Why will they stop at one? So you will end up having like 10 to 20 billion things you have to kind of store in your database. Try running that on MySQL, right? I mean, it's not designed for that. And, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you want to actually access the 100,000 of these 10 billion things, that are on your website at a particular amount of time, a streaming solution is brilliant. Even a million or so, it'll handle really well. But if you want to have all the history for these million objects over the last four months, each of them you're going to get 100 or 2,000 more objects. You can't store the 20 billion objects as well as all the history in, in DRAM and actually uh, build a, one of these, you know, all the startups I talked about, right? They need to be able to solve the problem today. They're not, they, and they can actually solve it by using a database which can do a very good index join, you know, uh, on, on these data and still achieve that at a fraction of the cost they would have to do if they had to store all of it in memory. And that's actually game changing for many of the smaller players because that will give somebody like APM the wherewithal to actually stand up to somebody like Alliance, Geo Money, and so on. And you're going to see this happen. And of course, they have to all do it all right, but technology is their friend. Okay, disruption in technology is what goes on with Flash and so on, which I'll talk about in a second. So that kind of motivates uh, the general problem here. So what exactly is the work that we have done at, at, at Aerospike, right? And, and again, there was a there was a, um, a slide from the previous talk, which is pretty much the same thing I put up here. You know, the only thing is uh, the 99 percentile is less than one mini, millisecond instead of uh, you know 10 milliseconds, and, and that's okay for the applications they're doing. For us, it's not. You know, for the applications that we are actually um, focused on, which is a narrow slice of the market, but it's really at the edge, at the most high end of mission critical kind of cases that you could ever care about. It's like a PayTM or a PayPal or, a, you know, like a Visa or a Master, pick whatever, you know, none of these, I'm not talking about these as customers, I'm just talking about these as uh, players who have to solve these problems, right? So, uh, the one thing I have, uh, I, w I want to point out is I have conspicuously left out so far is consistency. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll share a few thoughts on that later. Um, but, but I'm really talking about real deployments that have happened at scale for eight years uh, is, is basically the topic of this talk. And, and the future has to have consistency, much like what the speaker earlier talked about. And, and that's, you know, how much consistency can you get without compromising on the performance we're talking about here is a fairly sophisticated problem. And so what exactly, you know, is the current uh, architecture with everybody, you know, the traditional architecture here is essentially sticking a cache in front of a database. Okay. There are all kinds of problems with this. First of all, it's very complex. Caches fail, and when they fail, loading them back in creates a huge amount, you know, a huge amount of issues, and then it takes time. What, what do you show a user who's coming to your website when the, some cache has failed? The user doesn't care. They could make a trade. They would have made a payment. Their account has changed. They saw the new value. Great. Cache failed. They go, go to the website again. They see the old value. This freaks them out, right? They're going to come back at the bank and say, hey, you know what? I made the transaction. My money was in the account. Money I can't show. The bank is going to go, oh, don't worry, don't worry. The cash fail. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to come back in an hour. This is not a good user experience, okay? And I think the government will have regulations against this kind of stuff. And so you, you know, people could go to jail and so on, right, in, in, in some countries for this. So the, the consistency of the actual view a user sees is extremely important. And caching is extremely limited for this, these kinds of applications. You know, heuristically, it works well. Um, scalability is another issue, as I talked about, right? You have everything in DRAM. You know, if you want to show terabytes and terabytes or even terabytes of data in DRAM, a, a company like Big Basket will just not be able to compete today, right? And, and, but they need to compete, and there is a solution which, which I will talk about. But that's kind of the idea here. What am I trying to talk about is the work that we've done in Aerospike essentially eliminates this dual nature of cache and database and just sticks a database, which is as fast as a cache, in front of the edge, so you don't have to worry about persistence. Okay, because we put everything in Flash. We read directly off of Flash. We will use massively parallel architectures to make sure that you can push through a million, whatever transactions, you know, we, we've tested up to like five to 10 million per node on a 56 core machine. But really, we can push as much transactions as you can through memory, and we will make sure that there's enough architectural, you know, Flash kind of storage attached to the, to the machine for vertical scaling that you are now able to generate millions of transactions per second using SSD, okay, at, at sub millisecond latency. What that gives you is essentially very high scale, very low latency, and of course you need a distributor system. It's a given, stable state, you know. 
Um, essentially, uh, the other important thing is fast development. I think, again, the Cosmos DB talk talked about it. So you don't want to kind of have the traditional relational model of making sure that um, you have to, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, prefix all the schema. So fast application development is really important. Um, we have a shared nothing architecture in Aerospike. That's a, again, I'm, I'm not going to dwell too much on the technology here because uh, the talk just for you know, 35 minutes. But that's a VLDB paper. You expect that by now. Uh, you know, it, it, we have two of them, but you read the one from last year. Uh, it describes our architecture in gory detail. Uh, it talks about uh, how Aerospike achieves the kind of performance I'm talking about here. Uh, we, you know, we use a very specific distributed hash table algorithm with no hash hotspot, shared nothing architecture, a smart cluster. Our clients are smart so that it caches some of the mapping so that you're able to scale it very well. Transactions and long running tasks are be prioritized and run. This is a fundamental point. Whenever a node dies in a distributed system, you have to actually redistribute the data. Redistributing the data sometimes takes a long time. But however, normal transactions have to continue because we're talking about sub millisecond response time. So we need to have enough copies, we need to be able to uh, continue those transactions while these other things are going in the background, like um, you know, rebalancing. Uh, we also, you know, I, I'll, I'll focus less on this. XTR uh, has a basically a replication scheme uh, across data centers so that that gives you global distribution. Fundamentally, what you take away from this talk is indexes are in DRAM, data is in SSD. This is a fundamental part, you know, aspect of uh, the um, hyper memory architecture. And then this results in prediction you know, using parallelism, we can provide uh, extremely predictable performance, very high uptime with low management. So again, this is actually a repeated thing. I'll go back to this. Uh, one thing you know, I, I would like to focus on is um, I talked about a hyper memory architecture, some, you know, which is kind of the shown on the left of this uh, picture here. Um, we also, in Aerospike, have a pure in-memory kind of configurations we can do. The, what hybrid memory provides and some of the uh, techniques uh, we use are pretty classic. You know, log structured file system, you know, we use a copy and write mechanism. Uh, we always, uh, uh, it's like somewhat like the group commit that you're familiar with, uh, with relational databases. Um, you know, uh, indexes again are in DRAM. It's highly parallelized. You can fit a whole bunch of um, SSDs on, onto the node. Um, Okay, uh, and, and essentially what, what you can do is, um, uh, in parallel, access data directly from this. So cluster formation essentially is all about uh, backdrop. And this again was invented by uh, Leslie Lampert, who you, you heard from uh, in, the, in, in the Microsoft talk. Um, essentially the idea here is, a backdrop is actually an optimal algorithm for um, consensus in a distributed system in the presence of failure. And that's really important uh, because uh, when you have a cluster which is running, it is possible uh, for any, you know, this, this is a very simple example here. Uh, so where uh, there are three nodes trying to form a cluster, uh, essentially the, the basic idea is each of these nodes has to see all of the other nodes. How fast can you kind of come to consensus that the cluster formation is exactly uh, N1, N2, and N3? And we, we use basically factors for it. We only use factors for, um, Cluster. Uh, we do not use factors for actual data uh, syncing and so on, because that, would, that wouldn't give you the one millisecond response time. So when new nodes come in, the nodes go out and do that. Uh, in terms of uh, a partition map, uh, the basic idea of Aerospike is we use the right MD160 algorithm to hash every key, and that, that provides a 160 bit digest of 20 bytes, and we take 12 bits of it to create a 4K partition um, list set. So to speak. So given a key, uh, you know, given a C space, it is split into 496 partitions. Now each of those partitions, think of it as a divide and conquer algorithm. Each of those partitions are mapped to nodes. And then you have a mapping of uh, partitions to nodes with first copy, second copy, and third copy, and so on. So if you have two copies, there will be two columns in this mapping table. And this mapping table is computed uh, based on the original thing I showed of the cluster list, which factors kind of allows you to do. One of the things that we do with our partition mapping is that uh, I want to focus, I want you to focus on the second line here, partition C2. There's a whole algorithm, again, this is in the VLDB paper, you can look at it. We also have um, all of the code out there uh, in, in our open source version. So, uh, you know, everything I talk about here uh, is actually implemented, and more of it is implemented in the enterprise version. Uh, but the community edition essentially has all of these things. So you can download it and try it out uh, at your convenience. So if you take the second thing, the, the way our partition um, 
uh, map work, uh, we have assigned all of this in random. What that allows you to do, but also we preserve the order. So when the node, in, 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 what, what, you, you know, what, what the, the, the portion of the uh, picture shows here at, at, you know, at, at, at level B is that N5 is not down. If you notice, uh, N5 is removed from this and the rest of the nodes are in the same, you know, same list. Uh, because we are showing three copies here, so N3, which did not have a copy of partition two, will now get a copy of partition two. And when P5 comes back up, it will reinsert itself in the same place. So this is a way to reduce the amount of migrations you do when nodes come in and out of the cluster. Okay, we already talked about Paxos and how um, the Gossip protocol is used to figure out a new organization of the cluster. I'll skip past, past that. Um, here is, here's an important thing to know. So massively parallel architecture is important because what we do is, in, in Aerospike, is uh, we can take data and we kind of shard it across, uh, or cluster it across um, nodes. But within each node, we can do it across disks. So in this particular case, we have like five disks per node, and then we have four nodes. So it's a 20-way split of, uh, of, of the actual data, which means you have 20 SSDs which can be read directly, which is, which is kind of gives you a limit on the, on the throughput that you can actually achieve. Uh, writes are synchronous within a cluster. Reads can go to any, you know, reads are simpler, which go to anything, and all of this has to complete within one millisecond. That's kind of, uh, and then you can do much less than that, but, but that depends on your hardware. You know, if, you, if you're on a cloud provider, it'll be a little slower. If you're on your, uh, you know, it'll maybe like 0.5 millisecond, uh, but if you're on your own bare metal, fully tuned, it'll be like 0.2 millisecond. So those are the kinds of things that you can achieve. Um, I, th I think this is just a summary of um, what we do. There is, you know, I already talked about it. Um, in terms of data correctness, um, uh, I, th I think we basically focus on returning the latest copy of the data, no matter what's happening in the cluster. Um, the cache is, uh, we basically eliminate cache, as I pointed out earlier, and mixed workloads should also be able to uh, run well. In terms of uh, uh, distribution, what, what Aerospike does is allows asynchronous repli replication across clusters. So when you deploy Aerospike, you always deploy it um, essentially with um, a cluster in every data center, if you will, with an asynchronous replication uh, link between both. You can do two-way replication if you want, or you can do a hot standby. You know, it, it's basically an option that you have uh, in terms of how uh, you can set up the system. The idea here is um, it is since we are really focused on low latency, uh, if we would straddle a cluster of nodes across a wide area network, we will not be able to preserve the predictable latency which you need. So the trade-off then is um, if, if one of those um, clusters disappears, you do have a little exposure in terms of the lag that you have between when the first cluster talks to the second cluster. This lag is kind of proportional to the speed of light in a sense because it, you know how, how far the uh, clusters are determines what the lag is to a large extent. So if you have these clusters, many of many of our customers run clusters close to each other on the same data center or DRs, then it's virtually no lag. So also the other thing is um, we have to really focus a lot on high uptime because all of these systems they are only useful if um, the, the essentially the system runs all the time. Okay, and. and the other thing that we are actually spend a lot of time on, which is hard to go through here, but I think once again you can read the paper, um, is uh, we spend a lot of time in optimizations and speed uh, in terms of how code is written, right? If you look at the traditional databases like Oracle, Sybase, and so on, they're all written in C. There's a reason for that. They, they do their own memory, memory management, we do that. You know, we also work a lot on figuring out how the cores work uh, on these modern, modern architectures, and we make sure that you can do CPU pinning, uh, we, can, uh, we can assign um, the threads to the right cores, and, and also we have our cache line. You know, our, our index entries are exactly 64 bytes, uh, which, you know, which kind of coincides with the cache line. You know, all of that actually makes a really big difference here. Uh, we also, you know, a little bit about the data model, how data is organized. Uh, Aerospike is a row-oriented um, database, so what you have are columns, which we call bins. The bins can have flex schema, it's really a column. So you don't have to fix the schema. Uh, and what you can do is various kinds of, um, uh, what do you call it, the types in there. The important ones to point out are lists and maps, as well as GeoJSON. Um, these are ways in which you can run spatial queries on, on Aerospike, but you can also um, essentially keep you know, um, lists and maps, key values, and so on, 
in terms of, uh, you know, this, this, this basically just explains to you how um, the, you know, we use message packs um, in, in terms of the internal format. Again, you know, a lot of Aerospike is all about efficiency, how much can you get out of the hardware. An interesting thing is we, we, we work on commodity hardware, so if you're running it on bare metal, we get like really, really great performance, but if you run on cloud, we still get, you know, impressive performance, depending on the instance and so on that you use. So, so it's all about uh, uh, squeezing as much performance as you can out of whatever hardware we are given in order to, uh, you know, for the benefit of the applications and using the database. A uh, little bit about secondary indexes. Uh, we allow indexing on the base types, of course, string, uh, integer. We also allow I indexing of one level on list and map. So the idea of in Aerospec is we try to do things which will enable us to keep the performance SLA. So we do not, uh, whenever you see the features in Aerospike, they will be limited. So a hypermetry architecture in this case is enabling us to scale uh, 10x uh, higher, but with 10x cheaper kind of uh, footprint in terms of ETO. Uh, so when we have that kind of uh, requirement, we can't just um, um, do any kind of indexing, because some kind of indexing will make the system really slow, uh, not just for that kind of index, but, but for generally for all access to the database. And you want to stay away from that. So one level um, deep into a map or a list we can index. Um, our indexing is based on a scatter gather algorithm. So what that means is it is best for low selectivity indexes. So when you make a request for a secondary index, uh, you want to get a bunch of data back. So that means you can send the query to multiple nodes and get all the data back in parallel. That actually works really well. However, if you're just going to get an email entry back, it'll still work, but there's a little bit of overhead there. So you're better off using the primary index of Aerospike, which is as optimal as you can get. So what exactly does all of this architecture, I've kind of um, you know, given you an overview of this architecture, what does this help you in, in, in actual deployments? Right? That's kind of interesting. And, and that's where the surprising thing comes. Um, this is from a real deployment, uh, which kind of cut over maybe like 18 months ago. So what we have here is the previous system, which is actually missing uh, SLA. This is like a, you know, less than uh, two milliseconds, probably, SLA. They were missing 98.5%. So they're just missing 1.5% of, you know, they were only making 98.5%. Once, once they cut over, uh, we were able to make the hybrid memory architecture 99.95%, which means 0.05%. That's 30 times better. You're missing 30 times of your request. I mean, that's huge. Why is it huge? Because everything that you're detecting fraud on, if you can't actually detect fraud on, you still continue to complete the transaction. You can't wait. If somebody's transferring money, you transfer. You're not going to like say, oh, you're committing fraud. And then if the fraud algorithm cannot finish in time, tough luck. You deal with it later as a, a, you know, in terms of what you're doing. And that is very, very important to understand is the, the improvements you get from the techniques I'm talking about here are not like you're not going to get 30% improvement. You're going to get 10x, 20x. Otherwise, all of this work that I've talked about is not really worth it for something to deploy. And that's fundamental. And the important thing is you can do all of this, right, with low cost. This is from another actual deployment which, which went live um, probably, you know, six months ago or so. Look at the kind of savings you get. Right? This is the previous one. And, and, and the savings are not Aerospike savings, okay? The savings are triggered by Aerospike, and it's all, the, the savings are simply between size of your cluster, how much DRAM you put on it, versus you can stick it on in flash with a small amount of things in DRAM, which is basically where you put the index. When you look at it at that level, you're actually taking advantage of the billions of dollars of investment put in by Intel and Samsung and Micron and all of these SSD you know, manufacturers who are driving this cost curve, right? No other database in the world today allows you to drive that, you know, to use that in your application at the levels that you do, which means one of our earliest um, things about Aerospike was, our, our earlier slogan was, how do we provide the ability for startups to grow to Google scale without spending the kind of money that they basically, Google would be able to spend. Google's got a lot of money, Google's spend. How do you do that? Because startups will have to figure out a way uh, to do that. And, and essentially, this is how you do that. You produ produce something which can scale at Google scale at 10 times lower the cost, you know, and we ended up with like 10 companies over the last eight, you know, years who used the technology and grew to a billion. And one of them, you know, uh, actually is in. So you, you can see how this thing supercharged an internet economy. It will not supercharge a very paid, slow economy. A enterprise software is great. It works for that. For somebody who wants to take over the world, like, you know, like a KTM or a, 
uh, or an inmobi, they need to grow fast. And they cannot, they don't have the kind of resources the big players have. And there, but the good news is, the resources are produced by Moore's law on, on the hardware side. Uh, a little bit on the various kinds of, so Aerospike is not kind of a, a technology which is general purpose. We don't go in saying, you know, we are, you know, for example, Cosmos DB, it's a general purpose database. We don't compete with that. We don't compete with uh, Oracle, right? What we compete with is we compete for a use case where nothing really works. So if you look at the kinds of replacements we have here, everything is different. Why? Because people go with what they know best, they try to make it work.